welcome back to an introduction to airport privatization. In this lecture, we are going to look at airport privatization in the United States and begin with the introduction to airport privatization program launched by the US government. We will then discuss in subsequent lectures how the program went when applied to real airports. The move towards airport privatization in the United States started when Congress launched the Airport Privatization Pilot Program in 1996. The program was termed Pilot Program because a maximum of five airports were permitted to enter the program. The reason was, as the name suggested, it was a pilot program and United States government first wanted to test the idea before implementing it nationwide. The objectives of initiating the program were to increase access to sources of private capital for development of airports, make airports more efficient, competitive, and financially viable. In 2018, the law was revised and the program was renamed to Airport Investment Partnership Program. In this revision, the original limit of five airports was removed. Now, any number of airports could apply for privatization. Some salient features in the terms and conditions of the program are important to discuss here to develop a better understanding of the matter. The first condition was that commercial airports could not be sold to private parties. They could only be leased. Second, the owner of the airport, that is, respective state-level government, was not allowed to use the earnings of the airport for non-airport purposes. That is, the revenue generated from airport has to be used on the airport. This limitation was imposed so that the state government becomes bound to use money generated by the airport on the airport instead of funneling it to some other sector. The state government could ask US Department of Transportation to waive off this rule. However, it required consent of airlines bringing 65% traffic to the airport. So basically, if the state government wanted to take money generated from the airport out and spend it somewhere else, it required agreement of airlines, which made it more difficult. Third, the private party could not increase airport charges for the airlines faster than the inflation rate. This rule was made so that there remains a leash on the private party on what it is charging airlines, which in turn has effect on what airlines charge passengers. This limitation could also be relaxed if airlines agreed. So we can see that the terms and conditions of the privatization program were such that government had tried to ensure that after privatization, state governments improve airports by spending money on its development instead of using airports as a mean to finance other sectors, thereby ensuring that airport money may be used to develop airports and may not get used to achieve other objectives by the state. Secondly, privatization doesn't result in fares rising for passengers because the private party is charging profitability. Moreover, we can also see how a lot of veto power was held by the airlines, such that any private party that takes over the airport had to keep the airlines happy. The underlying assumption was, happy airlines means happy passengers. So this was and is still is the airport privatization program in the United States whose skeleton we just discussed. In the upcoming lectures, we'll look at how successful was this program in its implementation 
by looking at case studies of privatization of United States airports.